Hi, my name is Junko Yoshida, Editor-in-Chief of Ojo Yoshida Report. Welcome to the radar panel today. We do have all-stars because the people involved in this panel actually touches radar from various aspects of the uh, applications. Uh, but before getting into the details, I'd like to introduce our panel. Let's start with Sandeep. Hi, thank you. My name is Sandeep Panader. I'm the Vice President and Managing Director for Sensors Adaptive. All right, next up is Ralph. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, good afternoon. My name is uh, Ralph Mende. I'm the CEO and co-owner and co-founder of Smart Micro. We have been developing automotive radars for almost 25 years now. And uh, my background is electrical engineering. All right, very good. Okay, then let's go to Jürgen. Hi, my name is Jürgen Meyer. I'm head in the market segment automotive for Roder and Schwartz. We are, are a Munich based test and measurement company. Um, and uh, I joined Roder and Schwartz four years ago. I'm working almost 29 years in the automotive. Uh, and my job is to be the voice of the automotive and the ear of the automotive in order to help the company to grow the automotive business. And I'm here today because radar is one of the growth topics for the company. Very well. Okay. So, um, as I said, this is an all-star panel because uh, um, we got some tier ones, we got testing companies, we got the, um, the company like Smart Micro actually deals with, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the more of a interesting applications of uh, um, Raiders. But before we go through the panel, let's go to Stefan. Stefan, tell us, um, you're from NXP, tell us what you do. Hello all together. My name is Steffen Spannagel. I'm Vice President at NXP in charge of the ADAS business of NXP and I'm based in Munich, Germany. Welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, Sandeep. Sandeep, uh, you're from Aptiv, right? And I think uh, you have a, Aptiv has a joint venture uh, with Hyundai. It's called Motional. And I hear that you guys actually emotional, emotional had the really uh, interesting demonstration or sneak preview of a robo taxi. Tell us about that demo and what role that Raider played in that prototype vehicle. Sure, thank you for the question. Absolutely, I would say that um, Raider and the latest developments in general sensing and perception are finding their way into robo-taxi as well as production vehicle commercial applications as fairly mainstream and widespread today. As one of those technologies, as you point out, imaging radar, both on the hardware side as well as on the software processing side, it's absolutely a door opener when you think about reliable, affordable, autonomous driving applications. Um, we are a believer, though, that you need a combination of two or more sensing modalities in order to be able to get to the highest level of reliable um, performance when you think about um, level four, level five automation. So when you think about Aptiv and Aptiv's radar technology and the advancements that we're making, we're very much a proponent of a radar-centric approach. Um, to be able to maximize robustness, reduce the cost, the complexity, and increase the reliability of the sensing system. And what I mean by radar-centric, it's that the application relies very heavily on radar as the primary uh, robust, reliable sensing technology. And then you add some other technology like vision on top for those areas that a camera would be indispensable, like for traffic signs or lane markings or high beam control. And those are the systems that you'll see from Aptiv um, when we are producing either ADAS systems or AD systems with uh, level four, or level five automation. Okay, I just want to follow up with what you just said. I always thought it was the other way around, 
the baseline is vision, and then you add radar. But you talked about radar-centric solution. Tell me the logic behind it, and how is it different, actually? Yeah. Sure. Um, when you think about radar-centric solutions, or those that rely on radar to a greater extent, we consider this critical for safe, reliable performance. Systems that are solely based on camera are going to be limited by the ODD, or which is the um, operational um, domain with which the vehicle is able to operate. Um, they're going to be strongly limited for a couple of reasons. Um, one, from a functional safety perspective, um, also from a fail-safe perspective. Um, there are so many scenarios where the the road user, the complexity of the scene, the environment, they need the ability of taking radars that have really incredible kinematics and the ability to perform 4D imaging, right? Um, be able to look at distance, speed, the horizontal field of view and the vertical field of view. Those are the types of capabilities that you'll need for some of the more complex scenarios where a vision system is unable to perform um, the needed task. This is why we say that the sensors don't work in a vacuum. You need to be able to take the advantages and the strengths of each sensing technology. And our view is radar centric um, for when you get to the higher levels of automation are absolutely critical. I see, interesting. All right, so bringing that conversation, I'm gonna um, ask questions to Stefan because uh, NXP has developed really the, from the very beginning, you know, the, um, the uh, regular radar, well, I, I shouldn't say regular radar because I think NXP pioneered uh, CMOS, CMOS based radar, but then we're moving to imaging radar, just Sandeep mentioned. So tell us really that the, how the radar is changing the lands, landscape not just high end you know talking about autonomous vehicle but is it also changing the landscape of ada's uh market a a absolutely uh, junko uh, i mean 22 really might become the year of imaging radar i mean on the one hand side uh, we see first systems going into production might be very premium kind of passenger cars but also might what uh, sandeep indicated mobility as a service vehicles but on the other hand side and maybe even more important we see many many sensor developments being kicked off on imaging radar worldwide by many many customers and uh, that gives me a, a lot of good confidence that yeah imaging radar will really become not not only a premium feature but a kind of a mass market feature and uh, that that is really driven by by the the factor that also uh, sandeep already indicated if you compare it to other high resolution sensor technologies like like lidar as an example it comes also with a very high performance kind of level high resolution level but on the other hand side it comes with much less system cost at a much less system complexity as such, personally, I'm very enthusiastic about the, the opportunities from imaging radar, and I'm absolutely convinced that uh, yeah, imaging radar will go the same path as, let's call it, standard traditional performance radar did in the past, which was uh, starting at some customers, then yeah, being available at least one sensor per each car, and afterwards, even the next wave kicking in, which is about having multiple sensors, multiple imaging radar sensors in each car. So uh, bottom line, I'm absolutely convinced that over time, imaging radar becomes uh, as mass market adopted as uh, today's radar is already. All right, that's interesting. So, do you would you say that by bringing in imaging radar, can we actually eliminate some of the cocoons and radar around um, the uh, ADAS vehicles, or you actually need the uh, cocoon of radars as we see today, and then put image radar on top of it? I, I, I think what you point to is, is really one of the famous use cases of, of imaging radar, Junko, which is, yeah, some call it uh, urban environmental mapping. Okay. And, 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 and therefore, sure, I think, yeah, imaging radar is, is, is a key technology. 
But, um, I mean, the same, same hold might hold true for camera, but what is very important for, from NXP perspective is really that there are more imaging radar use cases that might even be needed to be served in parallel as such. Well, what, what we, for example, think of is not only use imaging radar to this famous, let, let's say, in environmental mapping 360 degree cocoon, but also use it for other use cases. I mean, really identify a motorbike changing lane at a mid distance or even in a very far distance. Uh, yeah, detect a ve not only a vehicle, but a vehicle losing a load. For example, the these are additional use cases of imaging radar where, where imaging radar can really add a lot of value over today's technologies. And as such, we, we really are, are, are a strong believer, not only for yeah, this kind of cocoon use case, but to further use cases. And the more use, ca the more use cases imaging radar can support, the easier mass market adoption will be, because then there are synergies in the system. And that is the, the reason why, yeah, also we are really eager to promote imaging radar, not only uh, with a narrow view on, on, on a single use case, but in a multi-mode, a three-in-one sensor. Okay. All right. So I think that actually gives a good segue to Smart Micros, Ralph. Ralph, tell us the uh, really the application, radar applications your company is innovating, that uh, where we are today and what new application can we expect? Yes, thank you, Junko, for this uh, question. Um, I believe the um, imaging radars uh, are particularly strong in any scenario where high angular resolution counts. And specifically, to give you some examples, um, most uh, adaptive cruise control users know scenario with ghost objects and phantom braking. And um, this, this kind of uh, scenarios can be solved much better using uh, imaging radars. And uh, other challenging scenarios would be, for example, a stopped vehicle under a bridge or a stopped vehicle in a tunnel or similar. And um, like uh, Stefan said, a vehicle losing a load leaving some debris on the road would be, um, would be possible to uh, manage using an imaging radar, uh, but not a conventional radar. Um, I think generally imaging radar is needed for level two plus applications simply because there are still too many situations which cannot be solved with conventional radars and also, the combination of conventional radars with camera, that combination uh, having limitations as well, especially in bad weather. So imaging radars have a large performance margin and can see objects with high contrast. And this, this not only allows to detect the objects, but also to classify them as uh, pedestrians or bicyclists or vehicles. So um, imaging radars will improve over time and uh, eventually future models may achieve a resolution close to or similar to today's LiDAR sensors. Yeah. And uh, to, um, to, to, um, to uh, maybe uh, comment on other applications beyond automotive. I, I also see a lot of potential beyond automotive. Uh, for example, my company is active in what we call traffic management or ITS. And uh, here imaging radar can be used for this type of application at uh, intersections or highways. The, the radars are here mounted at a stationary position. And uh, at intersection, at intersections, imaging radars with their high performance can detect and classify any motorized 
traffic participants like passenger cars or trucks and measure their positions and velocity vector. But they also and especially detect any vulnerable road users. And this data is then transmitted in real time to the connected vehicles. So they so that they can literally look around the corner at intersections. Yeah. They would uh, they would know that a pedestrian is on a on a crossing uh, even before they arrive at the intersection, and this helps to pr protect the vulnerable road users. Um, and the same would be a, or a similar use case can be described for a highway, uh, where all traffic participants are detected and classified in real time, and uh, positions, velocity vectors, and object classes uh, can be determined. And here again, we can deliver real-time object data from the imaging radar to connected vehicles, and uh, cars can use it for what we call collective perception, which would be a sensor data fusion of the data from the onboard sensors with data received from the infrastructure sensors. So these are just two examples of non-automotive applications where imaging radar is very welcome. And I, I believe where imaging radar will find, um, find uh, uh, a home. Other possible applications we can think of would be collision avoidance for automated vehicles. For special vehicles, think of uh, delivery robots, lawnmowers, forklifts, or automated mining trucks. All right. Before we move on, actually, um, I have, uh, forgive me for my ignorance, but I have one follow up question. When you talked about that um, putting imaging radar at a stationary position at the uh, traffic lights or the highway and so forth, that real time information, how, if I'm driving a car, how am I going to receive that? What's the connectivity that we use? And uh, can anybody receive that information? Yes, we would use the B2X connectivity, uh, which is built in many modern car models. And uh, the type of communication used uh, differs from region to region. Could be Wi-Fi, could be 5G. Uh, for the application itself, it doesn't matter. We need, uh, of course, uh, low latency, uh, high bandwidth communication between the infrastructure and the vehicle. And uh, so that makes the vehicles see around the corner. Is that uh, an interesting uh, idea? Yeah. yeah. Maybe to add, Ralph could also be DSRC technology. As, as, as another what does it stand for? Stefan, BDRC? Direct what? Uh, short range communication. This is kind ah, of a, a, okay. special, a special Wi Fi protocol for right. okay. communication. All right, we're going to come back to this discussion a little bit later, but I want to move on to Jurgen. Jurgen, you are at the test and measurement company, right? And what are you hearing from your customers who are in the automotive industry? installing radar are there differences that the in challenges uh, differences and challenges between the installing regular radars versus imaging radars what are what kind of questions are you getting from your customers so so very good question before i answer the question right i want to add to ralph so we have one product in rotor and schwartz which is based on 77 gigahertz imaging radar technology that's a body scanner, right? So if you go to airports, right, and they try to find out whether you bring on your stuff, right, then we are using the imaging radar technology to find out whether people bring weapons or something like that. And the technology we are using, it's a 10, it's a radar sensor with 10 gigahertz bandwidth. And with that technology, you can almost identify everything. It's like you're doing a picture in the optical domain. That's the te technology we have developed. And now to your question, right, what happens in the automotive with that increasing number of radar sensors? And the market is growing a lot. 
And uh, with that increasing number of radar sensors, new topics show up that we did not see in the past. So currently, one of the topics, that's interference. Uh, so you have a lot of these radar sensors. The cars are equipped with more and more radar sensors, and you need to make sure uh, that your own radar sensor is not disturbed by cars that come in front of you, for example. So this is an area where there is a lot of research, and some of the participants in this call also take part. Uh, we have worked together in re research projects from there. So uh, what we offer there is um, uh, we take radar sensors off the shelf, uh, we try to interfere them with signal generators we have. You need to have protected environments with unechoic chambers, right? And then we try to, uh, to disturb the radar sensor to see whether it's robust or not. And there's a lot of work going into this direction. So this is one part. Uh, then, of course, these, uh, these imaging radars, they're complex, they're complex radars. So they need to be calibrated uh, in, in R&D and in pre-production, also in production. So you need, to, you need to have new setups, right, to calibrate them. And then the next topic is, you know, we go from very far distances to very low distances. And these imaging radars, they have a huge aperture. And to test that, you either need big chambers, like chambers with the size of 15 meter, or you are using kind of far field, near field transformation uh, to test those sensors in a lab environment where you don't have the place right, to put in a 15 meter chamber aside the engineer that's developing something. So this is new technologies that we bring in. And I would say the next topic I, I would love to mention this is very often when I see what our customers are doing, um, then uh, the tier ones, they develop and validate a radar, sensors, a radar sensor, and then they ship it to the OEM. And the OEM will uh, you check the radar sensor in the lab, do a short test, does it work, does it not test work? And then they put it in the car and they go on the proving ground. And a lot of those tests then with the scenarios, they are done on proving grounds. And currently it's winter time, right? I live in Germany. We love to drive fast. Sometimes it's icy, it's snowing. So those tests, right, on proving grounds on highways, they are not and they are very expensive. So I think the industry needs solutions to bring those tests from the proving ground to the labs. So we currently have uh, developed a new technology where you can uh, simulate radar targets, not only in longitudinal uh, distances, but also in lateral. And we are using our body scanner technology where the big antenna arrays to let's say do this moving target simulation. And we believe that uh, this technology will enable uh, to do moving target tests in laboratory environments, in a reproducible environment, and basically in the end to save cost for validation and testing. And uh, I think introduction of the new radar sensors is all about also bringing costs down. All right. So um, when will that be ready? Are you still working on it? Ah, uh, we just launched the first version on the CES show in Las Vegas in January. And uh, I believe uh, the technology will move on. So with imaging radars, when we will uh, see like uh, pedestrians walking and we identify their arms and legs and what direction they are going to. That will also require more sophisticated test technologies in the future. So I think we are not at the end, we're just at the beginning. And then also think of those radars and automated cars. They have to be homologated. Uh, maybe we need inspection in the future. Uh, there is a lot of new topics that uh, still have to be solved. Understood. All right. 
Now, I'm going to open up the panel so that anyone who, is, um, who can answer the questions actually jump in, please. Um, the, you know, this is a very, um, I guess that uh, being a reporter, you report what other company executive says, and most famously, it was Tesla's Elon Musk who said that Raider is a full, fool's errand, right? And um, I don't think you agree with any, any, any of the people in this panel would agree with that, but I want you to make the case why Raider is no longer the fool's errand, or it was never fool's errand, would anybody want to take that? Sure. Um, I could take that one. Um, I, I would say that radar has been a very critical sensor modality for automotive safety. If you think all the way back 20 years to the very first automotive application for adaptive cruise control, it is the most reliable and affordable and scalable modality that's available if you want to democratize ADAS across all vehicles around the world. Um, however, there are limitations of radar for sure, but in the same vein, there are limitations of vision systems as well. And this is why you need a complementary approach. Radar outstanding at kinematics and performing very specific requirements um, in very complex environments. So I can give you a couple of examples of this. Um, if you think about, you know, the operational uh, design domain where you need to be able to, you know, s discriminate a, a, a small motorbike in a cluttered vehicle parking lot, the ability to be able to discern that particular motorbike or a vulnerable road user from the rest of the cluttered scene around with the advancements in imaging radar and the ability to be able to get vertical and horizontal azimuth discrimination and to create that point cloud that gives unlimited opportunities now when you couple that sensor capability with what you have with compute, the ability to take all of those point data points from the radar and create with advancements in machine learning and radar-based machine learning, the ability to actually get and discriminate that particular vulnerable road user from everything else. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, Ralph and others have talked about the ability to identify stop vehicles um, and bridges and to be able to discriminate whether or not you've got the under or over drivability in those complex high speed scenarios where you need long distance range as well. In most of these cases, um, you know, the ability for a vision only system to operate is, is, is not there. Um, now, on the other hand, you know, you kind of hear the comparisons of the driving ability to um, to that of a human. And if the human only uses vision or the eyes of the driver, um, I think that there's some fallacies with that claim. Um, there is no digital camera that has the perception capabilities of a human eye. No imaging sensor offers the same dynamic range um, or the resolution as well as the depth perception and the quality as a highly evolved stereo vision vision of of a human eye system. Um, so for autonomous driving applications, um, when you need the system to operate, um, when the human is not fully capable of the driving task, like in darkness and bad weather and poor visibility, cluttered environments and all of those complex scenarios, man, radar has been the most consistent and reliable sensor modality available to the automotive applications. Wow. Yeah, maybe to, maybe the, to yeah. add a little, little yeah. bit high, higher level, I, I, I think this kind of re redundancy concept of the sensor technologies is, is not only prom promoted by, by us here, we, we, which are, of course, strong supporters of ra radar technology. I, I think this is also shared with ma many other industry players, even being as strong, as strong in camera. As such, I think this is really a very, very outspoken, but maybe also a little bit isolated uh, position. <laughs> All right. 
I'm going to go a step further. Um, I hear more and more people claiming that, well, I think now we got this Raider Plus vision can actually uh, eliminate the, uh, the ne necessity of using lighter. Is that a fallacy or that's actually totally possible? Ralph, I, I, you, I, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, can, I can comment on that one. Um, I believe it uh, may be a very likely scenario that uh, the importance of LIDARs uh, would uh, decrease over time. Um, um, today, LIDARs are combined with, with cameras because they can, they can deliver good range information and, good, uh, and, and do that in good uh, uh, two-dimensional angular resolution in azimuth and elevation. But with the advanced advancements uh, in technology in imaging radars, radars, uh, such imaging radars will eventually come to that same level of uh, angular uh, accuracy and, and separation. And um, so they would, they would achieve a similar performance like LIDARs today, uh, but still have the physics on their side with the true speed measurement that, that uh, LIDARs can typically not deliver today, only to a limited extent at best, and the adverse weather performance. So these two physical principles will always speak for radar. And so over time, I believe what you described is a likely scenario. Interesting. Right. Maybe sure. to, to add, I think it, it's really a matter of time, Junko. But mm. what we have to keep in mind, I mean, imaging radar is, is at the ve very early stage these days. I mean, just, I not just looking at NXP, I mean, I think a couple months back, we, we released our first imaging radar processor to serious production. That's the first dedicated processor in the market at all. So that tells you that, that the market is, is really ve very early stage. And I mean, also from a technology perspective, I think there are still huge, huge opportunities ahead for us as an industry. So as time passes by, I'm really very, very confident that we can push the envelope at imaging ra radar performance a lot. Right. Well, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Is there anything that Sandeep would you, you you'd like to add to the lighter versus radar plus vision uh, discussion? I think it's been well stated so far. Uh, again, um, we got to think about these different sensor modalities in complementary ways. Um, as Stefan and others have described, the ability for imaging radar to become more ubiquitous because of it coming down the affordability scale is going to make it for 360 degree applications, I think, um, a lot more prevalent going forward. We're already seeing instances of it today and we'll only grow from there. Um, and I say that um, as a prediction because when you get that rich data from imaging radar, it almost is akin to LIDAR at that point at an affordable scale. And when you centralize the compute for that and you augment it with machine learning, you can effectively create a 360 degree environmental model that's unlike most other sensors that will be available at the cost basis that needs um, that's needed in order to make um, these autonomous applications affordable to the general user. All right, very good. Um, I think uh, we would like to wrap up. Um, in terms of, uh, I think there's actually there's a one data point that I'd like to share with everybody. It, I think it was both uh, Stefan and Sandeep mentioned that we are still in the early stage of imaging radars, and I think we are beginning to see a lot of startups also gunning for radars now. I mean, this it, it actually I think um, in the uh, 2021 turn, turns out to be the highest 
funds raised for Raider startups. That goes to show that um, the technology guys' interest in Raider is definitely on the rise. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming to the show. I really enjoy talking with, to everyone, but uh, stay healthy and uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Junko. Thank you, Junko. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.